Have you or anyone you know dealt with someone who committed suicide and are you surviving through that and recovering? Well, on today's show, we have two very special guests who are going to talk about just that. They have an incredible story that's going to empower you. Hi there, my name is Diane Forrester and this is I Have Today. This is the show that inspires, educates, and empowers you through life's transitions. And each week on this show, I bring on amazing guests, authors, experts, leaders, CEOs, and truly life changers who've gone through their own reinventions in life and have come out on the other side successful. And today I am honored to have on a mother-daughter team Carrie Conley and Laurel Wilson. Hi, ladies. How are you? Doing hey, Diane. How are you? Good. Well, um, so what we're going to talk about today is surviving suicide of a loved one. And these mm -hmm. two have an extraordinary story that they're going to share with us today about that. So if this is something that's affected your life or anyone you know, make sure to ping them, text them, get them, share this with them, and uh, let them experience what's, what these ladies have gone through and what they've discovered and their resources that they are speaking to the world about. They've got an exciting new book coming out that they're going to talk about that's really going to help and support <laughs> you. So, all right. So, Carrie, would you mind starting and sharing a little bit of your, you know, who you are and what you do, a little bit about the story? Sure. Yeah, so um, I am a speaker and an author. I specifically teach people how to have a very crystal clear vision for their life. Um, and their business if they happen to be entrepreneurs like I am. Um, I've been doing this in one capacity or another for over 25 years and um, have just created a whole lot of content to help people not only understand why they have to have a clear vision for their life, but how to actually write one mm -hmm. um, and work with people that come into coaching with me that they want to help that get figured out. And uh, I started as an entrepreneur 25 years ago and I was pregnant with my daughter Laurel and my son was two so that I could stay home and um, built that business in network marketing first. And then seven, seven or eight years ago is when I decided to start speaking and teaching on vision and knowing your purpose. Got it. Um, and unfortunately, in the past five years, we have lost both my husband and then my son uh, three years later to suicide. Uh, so this year was the year that Laurel and I decided to write a book about that and what we've learned in the journey. Mm, wow. Wow. Okay. Uh, Laurel, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah. So I, um, have actually been in the wedding industry for the last three years, which has been a lot of fun. Um, I started working in the wedding industry after graduating from Oklahoma state so I still live in Oklahoma. I actually met my husband in college and he is from Oklahoma. So we ended up staying here. Uh, we've been married for a year this coming weekend. So September 14th is our first anniversary, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. So again, I've worked in the wedding industry, have loved it, um, but you know, experienced a lot the last five years. And my mom and I just came to a point this year that we have felt such a calling to share our story and so we started working on this book together and have really started opening up and realizing that so many people need to hear this story. And so we are very excited to be on a journey of hopefully inspiring others and helping others while healing ourselves. Mm, so true. So if you're just tuning in, we have Carrie and Laurel on the show. And what we're going to be talking about is these, these, this is mother and daughter and they lost the, their father slash husband and son slash brother from suicide within a five year window of time. It's just incredible. So, I mean, imagine the suffer, the, the loss of one person yet to have two of them. So would you mind one of you or both of you, whoever wants to go first, you two decide how, uh, please share the story about what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, go ahead, Laura. I'll go ahead. <laughs> so about five years ago, um, I was actually right at the age of 20. 
Um, I was halfway through college and my brother had just recently graduated because he and I were exactly two years apart. Um, so we were kind of going through a transition as a family where I was leading into the end of my college years and Cole was just leaving college. Um, that my dad was kind of going through a patch himself of to us really seeming like struggling in the work area of not really understanding what he was doing next, kind of really struggling with that transition of my brother and I really becoming adults. And so he basically went through a whole phase of, you know, major depression, I guess that we didn't, I wouldn't say that we didn't pick up on it. You know, we knew something was going on, but it wasn't so much um, talked about. It's not like we were very aware of everything that was happening with him. Yes. Um, so from my end, at least to it came very suddenly that he did committed suicide in July. It was July 2nd. So I was in college and went home immediately, obviously. Um, so that was July 2nd of my junior year in college. And then three years following, my brother committed suicide as well. Um, you know, for us now being five years past all the transitioning, um, both instances had very different uh, leading up to it, I guess. They were both in very different places of their life. Um, but both of them were similar in aspects as well that we may, may dive into more in this, but, yes. um, you know, it was exactly three years apart for us. That we had some major transitions happen. Right. Wow. wow. Okay. So then I misspoke at the beginning. I thought it was five years apart, but it was five years ago is what, is, is that right? It's okay. Correct. Right. Yes. So it was yep. three it, years yep. apart. Okay. Yep. So, so tell they me. Were about, exactly three years apart. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, how old was your dad? So my dad was right around 53, I believe. Maybe my mom can correct me, but right around 53 at that point. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. And, and your dad's name was Ross. And how old was Cole, your brother? Mm -hmm. Yep. Cole would, would have been 25. So he passed away. August, three years um, after my dad. So it was almost exactly three years apart. And his birthday was November. So he would have been 25 in November. Okay. So he was still 20. Wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. Well, I, you know what? I don't really want to get into the details. I'm certain that you guys write about it in the book. And so we can share that then. Um, but mm -hmm. I do want to talk about what, mm -hmm. the, what happened for you. Mm -hmm. when well, a lot of changes, of course, because our family structure was really tight, very close family, um, mm -hmm. really, you know, enjoyed each other a lot, very, very open family, um, you know, great relationships all the way around. So for us, um, we talk extensively in the book about all the changes that we've had to go through, um, huge identity shift, first of all. Um, uh, not having that family unit anymore. First one Ross left and now Cole. Um, so we went through a lot of changes around family structure and lifestyle. Um, and that led to a lot of different relationships also changing um, mm -hmm. because we weren't the family people knew. So Laurel and I, first the three of us became a story. And then now, of course, Laurel and I are a story. So, so it's very different from how it used to be. <laughs> it couldn't be any different, more different. Right. Um, yeah. Yes. And now, of course, it affected how Laurel and I's relationship has become. Um, not only, you know, still mother and daughter, but best friends co-authored this book. Um, going to be creating some other things together. So we work, it's a good thing we work well together. <laughs> um, True. Yeah. This, I can tell already this is going to be a great conversation um, and that people who, who are seeking hope and help and support are going to get a lot of value out of this because, wow, that is just so much to take. And I hear it and see it in both of your, if you're, if you're listening to this and not watching it, you, you know, you should see both of these beautiful women. Um, but you can probably feel it in their energy that they've done a lot of healing and they have taken something that's so, um, so tragic and you really are, have found or are finding the gift and the, and the purpose yeah. in it and ways mm -hmm. to really help 
inspire and empower people, which is what we are so all about here. I love, I love having you guys on the show. So, so, so what happened? How did you two decide we're going to write a book about this? This is, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. So I think for us, there's a lot of things that fueled us wanting to write the book. And maybe you can touch on different points, mom. But for me, I felt like I was having uh, way more vulnerable conversations than I ever did before because I was sharing with people so much, um, so much of a deeper story than I had ever experienced. And I gradually began wanting to have that conversation with more and more people and wanting to be open because I saw what that was doing for other people. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about it and we're like, you know, <laughs> We, we can't physically talk to, you know, thousands of people, but we want to put our story on paper for people to hear it and hopefully connect with it. And, you know, there's been a lot of, um, I guess, mixed emotions for us because it is a lot to put out there. Yes. But even just the small experiences that we've had, just being able to help people is um, enough to, to continue with this journey. Right. So, yeah. Um, you know, when Ross died, the three of us knew that we were going to be using this story for good somehow. And as a matter of fact, before Cole died, he was going to be very involved in some of the things that Laurel and I are creating now. Um, so it's, it wasn't like we just woke up one day and said, we need to write a book. It's, we've always known that there is, there's, it's hard for people to believe this if you don't spiritually understand it, but we know that there's a purpose in it. And that it is God's plan and we're to use it for good. So instead of curling up into a ball and not functioning, which, you know, would be very tempting to do, mm -hmm. especially as we come, become more and more public with our story and more and more people begin to know Laurel and I that, um, you know, it'd be so easy to not bring this forward. But unfortunately, this is a very big epidemic right now, mm -hmm. um, especially in the age group of my son. Um, and so we just feel very called that we need to share this story of hope and, uh, getting past the adversities. Yes, it's so true. You know, suicides, the number one age group, this is why I asked about your dad. I mean, I could have mm -hmm. asked he'd be in this yeah. segment, but you know, between the ages of 45 and 64, the number one age mm -hmm. group of people committing yes. suicide and mm -hmm. then young adults, you know, it's as young as 10 to, you know, 34 is the second group. And mm -hmm. it, it, I feel that same way too. It's, um, it's crazy what's happening. I have had in the last couple of weeks, my girlfriend, her neighbor below her and jumped mm -hmm. to his death. Uh, a good friend of mine, his brother's, uh, his friend's brother committed suicide. And this is all in the last couple of weeks. And so it's got to stop. And so I'm so grateful that you two are out sharing this story and helping to empower others. And, and so what I want to know from you are um, if you, if you can help with one or two tips on possibly signs, because here's the thing, this is, this is like an invisible disease. This is the silent killer. I attempted suicide and, and people would say, are you kidding me? Like you had this habit all life. And so no one is immune to it. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter if it's something you've been thinking about for a long time or it's a knee jerk, you know, uh, reaction to something. Um, there, there are, there are some telltale signs when, when something is going on and people will say, I'm okay, okay, you know, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'll be okay. And so anything, any light you can shed on this right now would, would really be amazing. You know, one or two things. Mm -hmm. um, well, unfortunately, Diane, I wish that it came with that easy of a neon blinking light of, of you being able to, to detect that somebody is having that dark of a thought. Um, because in our case, especially neither my husband nor my son would have been somebody that you would have thought, uh, would have done this. Mm -hmm. They were, especially my husband, the life of the, well, they were both just very outgoing, very loving, very fun, um, very successful in what they were doing. Um, even though Laurel and I detected them both struggling and having anxiety, neither one of us for one second thought that they would have taken this this 
uh, step, right? So it's so hard to say, look for the signs. Obviously we knew that they were battling some anxiety. Um, we knew that they were um, both, uh, the job thing was something they were both struggling with. And I think for men especially, so much of their identity is attached to what they do that when they don't get that confirmation there, it's a huge hit on their identity and their self-worth. Yes. Um, so, you know, I wish that I could say, you know, it's the people that are actually asking for the help. But my experience has been that if they're asking for the help, and I think Laura would agree that they are really not, they're, they're asking because they really don't want to do it. Yeah. It's the people, it's the people that don't talk. That is the scary part. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I understand that. Yeah. Well, and we know the, you know, the crazy statistics with anxiety and depression too. It's yes. And it is, and you're right. And for men, um, their self-worth is so tightly connected to their network. And, and I said net as in N E T not uh, yes. worth W O R T H not yeah. network, but their Ooh. net worth is, is um, really, yeah. really important to them. You know, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's how they value themselves in many ways. So not all men, but, but many, many men. So, and yeah, that well, is fascinating. Well, unfortunately we have a culture that perpetuates that. Yes. Um, it's all about the identity and it's in the success and it's not about who you really want to be. Mm -hmm. It's what's going to make you successful and look good in the world. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and I think one thing too, that maybe this could fall under the, you know, tips or whatever kind of category, but I think it's people just having a conversation among their families, you know, to be honest, growing up, we didn't talk a whole lot of, about depression. It wasn't really something that we felt like we were dealing with as a family. You know, it's not like we uh, shielded away from it. It just wasn't really like a common conversation that we had about anxiety, about mental health, about depression. And it's not talked about among friends. And, you know, I think people are really starting to shift towards that and making it more of a conversation. And that's kind of, you know, a big purpose with us and sharing our story too, so that people have a little bit easier time talking about it and understanding it. And I think that sometimes people maybe even don't realize how deep into a depression that they're going. So they've never had a conversation, to understand what that's looking like. Yeah. So making right. that more aware for people. That's yeah. a really good point because that becomes their normal. Mm -hmm. I think it's, this is, this is just the way I feel. Um, right. Right. So, mm -hmm. so having more conversations, being honest, being available. And this is, this is just general stuff. This is not like a right. bit of or anything, of course not. Right. Yeah. But for, um, I know for myself, I didn't tell anybody until after my, you know, my experience and what happened for me, it's all in my book, but this isn't about me, but I did tell my sisters a month after but they didn't know before. And, yeah. I, and, and so, and I find that you, I, I was coaching a client the other day and what she was telling me is she's struggling. Her son, her 20 year old son who's living with her is struggling to find his place in the world. You know, is college, college isn't working. He's very creative. He's not really fitting in, you know, all of these social stressors and um and he's really not doing anything he's not taking you know the garbage out and he's not helping around the house you know he's literally in such mm -hmm. a state and uh her response to him is you know you know it, it's it's like they're coming down she's coming down on him and of course she's frustrated too because she's you know running the household and doing all of this and i said to her what if you just spent the next week, just saying to him every day when you came in, you know, what'd you do today? And if he says, oh, I played video games. Oh, what video games did you play? What are you interested in? You know, and just focus on a light, something, some seed, because there, 
when when that emotion happens, this is my perspective. Sometimes you just can't get out of from under it, and when mm-hmm. you're emotional and in that state, the dark and the lows are so low, and the mm-hmm. highs can be really high. They're so low. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I just think for anyone listening out there, like think about your kids, think about your spouse, like what what's going on where you could be more loving and nurturing and just unconditionally accepting them just as they are. And um, okay, so so share with us because I know this book is about hope mm-hmm. and dealing with the adversity and all of that stuff. Um, can you talk a little bit about it? And by the way, the name of the book, which I love, is Keep mm-hmm. Looking Up. Mm-hmm. And it's going to uh, premiere. It's coming out on 11-11. I love that, November 11th. And um, you said something to me, Carrie. Um, it's from a heavenly perspective. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, the book um, title actually – we used it at my son's memorial. We gave everybody um, golf balls at the memorial because my son loved golf. Mm. And for some reason, I don't know why, I want to print it on the golf balls, keep looking up. So when Laurel and I decided to write this book, this was the only option for the title, right? Mm-hmm. But here's why. You know, most people, of course, ask Laurel and I, how in the world are you getting through this and surviving? And are, there's so many answers, and we talk a lot about them in the book tools that we have used, things we've gone through. Laurel and I have healed in different ways that's worked for us. But the biggest thing is that we have a heavenly perspective. Mm. That we know, like I said earlier, that this was God's plan. It's hard for people to understand that we believe that, but we do. Um, And that this, thank goodness, is a very temporary thing. And that we will all be together again forever. So that's what keeps me going is knowing on my worst days that this is just a day, right? <clears throat> and to have that, that heavenly perspective of, you know, just looking toward what's coming next. Yes. Right. So that's why that was the title of the book. Yeah. That's a beautiful title. Mm-hmm. I love that. Um, uh, so, and in the book, you said that you've got um, some, things that you've been through and even some, some exercises or, you know, yeah. So to help other people cope and use right. coping mechanisms, correct? Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So we actually, um, I was pretty adamant about this. I know we both were, but really creating those exercises for people on both ends of <laughs> the situation where they're the person actually going through, whatever it is, you know, the obstacle that they're facing, but also for people who are close to those other people, you know, we had so many people in our lives trying to support us the best that they could heal themselves so that they could be there for us. And so within the book, we wanted those people to read it too, and be able to kind of work through that and think about better ways to support people who really are grieving. So it's kind of tips for everyone, which is um, hopefully going to be helpful. Mm Mm-hmm. So let me ask you, uh, Carrie, what's been the biggest challenge for you? Um, I think it's, like I said earlier, it's been the shifts in identity, you know, for us to have to go through a whole different way that people are seeing us now. Yes. Um, that's been really eye-opening for, uh, for Laurel and I to see how people have reacted to the changes in our life and to us and the, this, the decisions that we've made because of this new life that we're in. Um, so it's been, I think the biggest challenge has been that it completely changed how our family looked, how it looks now, how we thought the future was going to look. Um, it's just a big identity shift. Yes. Yeah. And people yeah judgment and perception of it and people don't know what to say or what to do or how to act and respond. Yeah. Right. Right. That's that's been challenging. Laurel and I have really had to work through that a lot because um, unfortunately sometimes the expectations that you had of people weren't, 
they just didn't know how to respond to us. And so we had to learn that they just didn't know what they didn't know. Right. And, and to be okay with that. Um, mm. One of the chapters of the book is entitled grace and mercy. Mm. Um, we've had to learn to give a, a lot of people grace and mercy, not just because they just don't know right. what they're doing or not doing. Um, so we talk a lot about that. So Laurel, what has been the biggest challenge for you? Yeah. So the biggest challenge that I have dealt with and really am still dealing with is the change of stability. You know, I grew up in the same, pretty much the same neighborhood for 20 years of my life and had a very stable family, you know, that we were so close and that changed very quickly for me and yeah. continued to change. You know, again, when my brother died, it felt like it kind of all got uprooted again. And so I just really had to shift into the second half of my life, if you will, it's just been a lot of change. And that's not something I'm used to. So I'm, I'm learning to roll with it a little bit more and to also learn how to heal through all of that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And feel the loss too. Yeah. Um, you're both amazing women and you have taken uh, what is such a difficult situation and you're truly, you know, outward facing people now in a place of service, creating what you're, you know, this book and this message and support and hope for people, which is awesome. And so I want to ask you both, because I ask everybody, how do you live the I have today way, which is intentionally, you know, with passion and purpose in your life? Carrie, you, you please answer first. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, every day to me is just another opportunity to keep looking up. And that we don't know if we have tomorrow and that I have a calling and a purpose and my calling and purpose in life is to, is to assist other people in helping them figure out their vision and their purpose for their life. Yes. Um, so that's how I live every day. Um, intentionally is that I know there is something I am still left to do while I'm here. Yes, for sure. Yes. Okay, Laurel, how about you? So to me, that really means um, embracing vulnerability. I think that people really connect when you're vulnerable. And sometimes even when it's really hard for me to be vulnerable, and I know that a conversation's come up for me to be able to share my story and hopefully connect with somebody else, I have to push through my own pain sometimes to be vulnerable with other people because I know that that's going to make a difference for them. But, you know, also me living out my purpose of being vulnerable and sharing my story with as many people as I can. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, is there one final piece of advice you, you'd like to share um, or something you'd like to, to say to the audience who might be hearing this? I think, I think it's just important that everybody needs to know that they do have a purpose. I'm a big believer that we've all been sent to this earth to, for one with one unique thing that only we can carry out individually. Yes. And I think people lo lose sight of the fact that they do matter and that they do have a reason for being here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. Well, that's, that's how we live here at I have today. Absolutely. You do have, you came here for something for a reason and you matter. You are enough just as you are. Cause this is my mission work too. This is such a huge uh, issue for me too. So I, that's why I wanted to have you guys on the show. So, all right. So how can people find out more information about you and, um, get the book? Uh, so my website is just my name. Um, Diane, it's just carrieconley.com and my team makes sure that they keep everything loaded up on there. Our book tour, the book launch, the, um, the workshops and the events that we are doing. As I told you, I'm, I'm starting to work with young adults, so there's more information coming for that, too. So for right now, that's how you can find both me and Laurel and where we're going to be. Perfect, perfect. Well, we'll have links for that in the comments section, whether you're watching this on YouTube, you access it through our website or on iTunes or any of the other streaming platforms, we'll, we'll have the information there, so... I want to thank you both so much from the bottom mm. of my heart, being here, being vulnerable and doing the work that you're doing. You know, and I know that they are 
both Ross and Cole shining down from heaven, looking at you mm -hmm. with love and light and um, yeah, getting goosebumps. Yeah. So <laughs> it's beautiful. And so you just keep looking up. I love that. So wonderful. Thank All right. You. Well, um, one thing I'd like to share because it is so passionate to me as well is I have done a lot of research on this and I have discovered that there are so many people unhappy and the statistics are as high as 90% now, if you can believe that. So what I've done is I've created a program called the Happiness Formula, which is a three module program to help you get clear, get the clarity, get the answers of what it is you want and what happiness looks like for you. And so we're gonna have information if you wanna learn more about it, how to access it, also in the comments sections below, you can find it at dianeforster.com, the happiness, forward slash the happiness formula. And um, there are other great things on the website as well. So anyway, that is it for this week's show. What I did want to leave you with is an intention statement for you because we like to do this every week. And it is, I have today to trust in the divine plan. Now know that Ross and Cole were on their own journeys and now Carrie and Laurel were on their journeys as well. And this was all part of the divine plan and you have a divine plan too. So do your best to figure out what that is, your vision, your mission, and your purpose for being here and surround yourself with supportive people. Do not be silent. If you are unhappy, please speak about it. And we're here for you always.